It's March 28th, 1971, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. What do you do when a legendary show on your TV network, one which once brought the world landmark performances from the likes of Elvis Presley and the Beatles, sinks to 43rd in the ratings? You axe it, of course, if you're CBS. And so it was that Today in History in 1971 saw the last ever non-rerun edition of The Ed Sullivan Show, even though it was still attracting 23 million viewers a week. Although I suppose when you consider the full population of the US, that's um, not the titan of the entertainment industry that it once was. Well, yeah, he'd been on the air at that point for 23 years. And apparently his, his one ambition was to make it to 25 years. That was all he wanted to do. And they just wouldn't give it to him. But in the end, the cancellation came down to cost. The show cost $8 million a year to make. And this was at a time when TV networks were starting to get the rights to broadcast Hollywood films. That was something that hadn't really been done before. So not only were they buying the rights to do the first TV showing of popular recent films, but also films that have gone out of copyright. And because people weren't used to necessarily seeing big blockbuster movies on TV, those were drawing huge audiences. Mm. And it was also kind of a side effect of a wider move in TV. It was called The Rural Purge in the early 1970s, when networks were starting to ruthlessly cull content, which was popular, but drew an unfashionable demographic. A poorer demographic is the point, Mm. isn't it? (laughs) You know, the people who were watching Ed Sullivan, but also the Beverly Hillbillies, Green Green Acres, Lassie and Hogan's Heroes, all shows that got purged out in this year of 1971, had less money to spend on the items being advertised at them. Mm. But I think CBS were aware that Ed Sullivan was a name that we'd still know all these years later because of these legendary performances that had happened on his show. And yet, he as an individual, it has to be said, I'm going to say it now, (laughs) has an astonishing lack of charisma. I mean, he's a... For someone who is essentially famous as a TV presenter, he's one of the worst TV presenters you'll ever see. I mean, it's just, he lacks the fundamental skills to be able to do the job. He's not likeable. He doesn't look good. And he mumbles his lines. I mean, like, what the, how the hell did this happen? (laughs) It is amazing. Like, he actually says himself that it was his older sister, Helen, who got all the brains of the family. What he had going for him was that he was a very talented athlete. Throughout his school career, he was a really good baseballer, (laughs) basketballer, footballer, even quite good at track. Those skills don't necessarily lend you to being a fantastically vibrant personality on television and yet after he finished being a sort of star athlete in university he then became a journalist and he bounced around various roles and papers until he became Broadway correspondent eventually settled at the New York Daily News Uh, he had this column called Little Old New York and he then from there kind of parlayed those skills into uh, being on, on radio and eventually his radio show became a TV show, which was first called Toast of the Town and only later became The Ed Sullivan Show. Yeah, he'd got into the content side, if you like, of showbiz by being a producer on various vaudeville shows and organising various charity reviews, for which he also served as the MC. That was where he was honing his limited presentation <laughs> skills. But he was very, he was pretty good at the organising side, at least, and he, would, and he would later go on to be really involved with the behind-the-scenes stuff on the Ed Sullivan show as well. Two charity concerts he organised at Madison Square Garden during World War II raised $500,000 for humanitarian organisations. Mm-hmm. And it was here at Madison Square Gardens that he was first noticed in 1947 by CBS executives. He was emceeing the Harvest Moon Ball, an annual ballroom contest, and it was being televised for the first time. And this was kind of the early days of TV. It wasn't that hard to get a TV (laughs) show, I feel, if you were already kind of in the business. Yeah, you get the sense that he really was genuinely interested in performance and in talent and unearthing them and putting them on his show. But it's astonishing that he got off the ground at all, given some of the early reviews that he received. One reviewer, Harriet von Horn, uh, wrote, He got to where he is not by having a personality, but by having no personality. To which, by the way, Ed Sullivan wrote back and said, Dear Miss Van Horn, you bitch. Sincerely, Ed Sullivan. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, he may not have had the style, but he had a way with words. A certain panache. The comedian Alan King kind of summed up the enigmatic appeal of Ed Sullivan by saying, Ed does nothing, but he does it better than anyone else in television. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Yeah, there was another review that I found from Time which said, basically, instead of frightening children, Ed Sullivan charms the whole family. Basically, he was the average guy who brought these great acts to 
people's homes. And, you know, one of those acts, as it turned out, was Elvis Presley eventually, because he was actually very resistant to the idea of putting uh, Elvis on his show. Putting Elvis's lower half on his oh, show. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, he, he just thought that it was too risque and it would uh, scare the horses, I guess. Arouse the horses. Yeah. And so what they do, anytime Elvis starts shaking his hips, the camera cuts to his face. <laughs> it's the most amazing thing. Which is annoying because that's arousing that too. That is also They're like, arousing. what can we yeah. show? <laughs> Cut to Ed Sullivan's wobbly chin. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, the weird thing about that is that this is a great example of Ed Sullivan being one to sniff out talent early. In fact, actually, his first show in 1948, way back when it was still the toast of the town, featured Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, who at that point were just a nightclub double act. You know, they yeah. hadn't been in any movies or TV shows themselves yet. But it was Ed himself who witnessed Beatlemania firsthand at Heathrow Airport. This was in October 1963. This was before the Beatles also cracked the US. He could see that there was this phenomenon around them and he booked them onto the show. And by the time they actually appeared, which was February 1964, it was just a few weeks after I Want to Hold Your Hand hit number one in the US. You know, so the timing was absolutely impeccable. And that became the most watched program in TV history at the time, drawing 73 million viewers. It's so funny because he is so evidently willing the Beatles to just be nice young men. And the hilarious thing is that when like he's standing in front of them, they're all of them having to bite their tongues and play the game yeah. and continue to appeal to the audience that they know that he is trying to appeal to, even though that's very much not them and just around the corner is going to be the long hair and counterculture and revolutionary this and that and experimentation. Yeah, that was a big contributing factor to the cancellation in the end. You know, young hip acts no longer needed to be presented to middle-aged America to be accepted. That was kind of the role that Ed Sullivan had been fulfilling. He was acting almost as a tastemaker, right. saying, "I have, you know, they have passed my mental examination. They are clean enough, decent enough to be allowed into probably your lives. fight for their country. Don't <laughs> yeah. worry. Exactly. But then there was this cultural shift and these acts themselves didn't care. The listeners and consumers at home didn't care either. You know, they liked what they liked and they didn't need to be told by, you know, a 70-year-old Irish-American <laughs> man that actually Elvis is fine yeah. now. And the acts themselves were becoming increasingly disobedient about Ed Sullivan's uh, insistence that they had to behave in a certain way to even be on the show. For example, uh, the Doors were told that if they were going to sing Light My Fire, Ed Sullivan didn't believe that some of the lyrics were appropriate for his audience. And so he wanted them to change the words, <laughs> girl, we couldn't get much higher to girl, we couldn't get much better. Girl, I need your help lighting my fire. Please. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know anyone with a fire lighter? <laughs> <laughs> but when they got to the crucial lyric, Jim Morrison just was like, screw you, and sang the actual yeah. lyric because he didn't well, care. Of course he would. And, and that was yeah. the same story with so many acts that went on. They just refused to kowtow to the Sullivan monolith. Yeah, I mean, 1971, like even when he reverted to Broadway, I mean, that was the way to try and, you know, get some more kind of wholesome show tunes for the, for the older ones on. Is Because it was a variety act. You'd have comedians and then you'd get some, something from a musical if you were a bit worried about the pop acts. The biggest show on Broadway this year was Hair. Yeah, which yeah. actually, and they went on the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> they did Aquarius Let the Sunshine In. But I mean, you can see that With that's him uncomfortable. Tutting and sweating in the background, presumably. <laughs> Putting more layers on. <laughs> This is the thing. The, the clips that have survived, you know, they get passed around now are Elvis and the Beatles. But it was a true variety show. Up to 50 million Americans were tuning in every Sunday. You did have to have something that appealed to everybody. So, you know, you, you might see Elvis, but you might also see an opera singer. You might see a stand up. You might see novelty acts like Topo Gigio, the Italian puppet mouse. He was very popular, right? He was the yeah the most popular puppet they had, and he had the Muppets. I I, I tried to watch a bit of Topo Gigio to try and see what the fuss was it's about, and it is unwatchable. <laughs> Every time the mouse rocks his pelvis, the camera cuts to his upper body. <laughs> but to be fair to Ed Sullivan, he was actually a pioneer in at least his appreciation for black talent, and he had mm. these amazing early appearances from Bo Diddley and Jackie Wilson and Fats Domino and so on. According to his biographer Sullivan once had a Ford executive thrown out of the theatre when he suggested that Sullivan stop booking so many black acts. By the end of this run, though, he was showing signs of dementia. There's an interview on The Tonight Show that he did where Johnny Carson asks him about a time when he forgot the name of a person he was introducing and so he kind of covered up for it badly on live TV but everyone at home knew. And that was kind of like the open joke was like, mm. you're forgetting stuff, Ed. Um, Joan Rivers claimed that she first got booked on the show 
because the team had been pitching him Johnny Rivers, the singer, and he went on stage at the end of the show and said, next week, everybody, Joan Rivers. (laughs) Tomorrow. 700,000 people had to work on this tomb whilst he was alive, which took 36 years. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.